morning. Doing well today? <laughs> okay. You're here, so that counts for something. Good to see you. Got to get closer. Closer to the edge. Because I kind of am on the edge, yeah. Really, it really is good to see you. I mean that. I'm not just saying it because I'm a pastor here. I truly say that it is good to see you. I really appreciated uh, worship this morning, and I'm grateful that we can focus on the name of Christ today. And that is what we're looking to. By the way, uh, yesterday, last night, for those of you who were not there at the Kajani Farm fundraiser, was a, a wonderful thing. Sorry, my, this is going to be sliding down. I usually do that. It's okay. I um, just want to say my prayer is for us as a congregation. I pray uh, a lot for us. I pray a lot for you. I, pray, I just <laughs> pray a lot. Um, I want to do that more and more. Um, one of my prayers is we as a congregation would be uh, intric- intricately and intentionally and passionately involved in God's word reaching the world, okay? And so missions is something that we do around here. The word is something we do around here. Prayer is something we do around here. Worship is something we do around here. Fellowship is something we do around here. Discipleship is something we do around here. We do all of these things. And when I think about us as a congregation, I love to see God working among us. Because there are very few things that I can do, right? I have words, I have some energy, we have some power. But God is the only one who can change hearts and minds. Jesus is the only one that switches us from death to life. right? And we need God's power to be working among us. Regardless of how eloquent we are, regardless of how wonderful the worship is, if God's presence is not moving, it does not matter, okay? And so my hope is that we would pray. My hope is that we would give generously. My hope is that we would go and support, that God's word would reach all of the corners of the world to all people everywhere. And guess where that starts? In, that's right, in your heart, right? That Christ would be alive in your heart, that our mind would be focused in on what truly matters. And it goes from this place to this place to this place to this place to the corners of the world. So let us focus in on who Christ is. Let us focus in on what he's doing. And let's join God in the work that he is doing, right? Not asking him to bless our work, but join him in what he's doing. So we have to ask, what are you doing and how can I participate? Now this morning, we are going to continue walking with Jesus in the gospel of John. We have been seeing him from the opening pages. We've seen him minister in Jerusalem. We've seen his baptism. We've seen him drawing disciples to himself. We see him interacting with a religious ruler named Nicodemus. We see him interacting with this marginalized woman at a well. Last week, we saw him connect with an official as he had a son who was dying, and Jesus took this man from going from welcoming him to honoring him to trusting in his word to giving his life to him. And so we've been traveling as Jesus has been going throughout Jerusalem and throughout Israel. And last week he was up north around the Sea of Galilee, a place where he uh, grew up in Nazareth. And then this week now we see Jesus strategically moving back down south and up in elevation to Jerusalem again. And we're going to see his interaction with another man. And we'll learn more about Jesus, we'll learn more about how he works, who he is, and why that matters to us and our community and our family. 
So let's go now to John chapter 5. If you have a Bible somewhere on your phone, in front of you, wherever, turn to John chapter 5. And we're going to see a number of things from this passage you may or may not be familiar with as Jesus interacts with a disabled person who was, again, wading by a body of water. Okay? So this is my first Point. Okay, I'm going to give you the point and we're going to look at the passage. First point, Jesus strategically works. Jesus strategically works. So here we go, John chapter 5, starting with verse 1. After this, okay, after Jesus being in Galilee, after being up there, these passages are connected. After this, or at some time after this, depending on your version, there was a feast of the Jews, a gathering of the, the Jewish nation in Jerusalem. And Jesus went up again to Jerusalem. So he's traveling from the north down to the south to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool, an Aramaic called Bethesda. And by the way, Bethesda means house of mercy. There is this church right up the road from us called Bethesda. Okay, have you guys noticed that church? Anyone? It's right there. It's an old church, right? Weird name. What about Bethesda? Well, actually, if you knew your scripture, that's a great name, right? House of mercy. So Jesus traveled to Jerusalem to this place called Bethesda, which means house of of mercy, which had five roofed colonnades. And this is what a colonnade may look like. They've dig, dug it up, okay, and they say five roofs. There's actually one, two, three, four, five, so one long one on each side. It was a place that had two pools in it and kind of a, um, uh, a hallway with columns with the roof, okay, so it provided some shade for those who wanted to gather there, and many people gathered there. So Jesus specifically went to this place, which was near the temple, but not right at the temple. And so this is where he strategically traveled to. Now, in these, in these colonnades, in these places, lay a multitude of disabled people. You can go to the next slide, please. The blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One man was there who had been disabled for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Now the sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed. And he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. Okay, let's stop there. So we need to understand what's happening here. In order to understand, we need to make some observations and ask a few questions. So again, Jesus was north in the region of Galilee. And then at some time later, he went back up to Jerusalem for a feast which assured many people would be in the city, okay? So he was strategically working. Why did Jesus do this miracle at this time, in this place, to this man? Now, Jesus could have done this miracle anywhere, right? He could have done it up in Galilee, and he had to travel a long distance from the north to the south. And there was many towns and many opportunities for Jesus to do such a mi- miracle. But he did not do that. He chose to work here intentionally, strategically, in the area that was at the center of Jewish worship and religious 
piety and power. He was going to the center place of the Jewish system and the center place of worship. He intentionally went there. Now, Jesus didn't go directly to the temple. And the last time we read about him was in John chapter 2, where Jesus taught and did signs and wonders around the temple. The last time we saw Jesus, that, where, that is where he was working. But not this time. He went to a, a different section. And my guess is, based upon what we're going to see in this passage, he didn't want anyone who was at the temple when he was there to recognize him. So he went to a, a distance away, but close enough so there will be religious rulers or very pious people to observe. And Jesus didn't heal everybody. Do you notice this? We have one guy out of a multitude of guys. And so there could have been dozens, and I'm thinking multitude, multitude says hundreds of people. So put that sense in your mind that there was a square, there was hundreds of disabled people. So why did Jesus single out this man? I believe Jesus did so because he not only was looking to heal this man, and we'll see, get to his heart, but he was looking to make a bigger point. And so one, at first, he wanted to make sure that this person who he healed didn't know who he was. He did this miracle, at first, anonymously. So he was probably looking for someone who was either, number one, blind, couldn't physically see, right? Or someone who could not be transported easy, someone who was disabled in their legs, couldn't move. So this person would not identify him by sight or perhaps not identify him by hearing. So he was looking for a specific person. And he chose a person that had to do some quote-unquote work, all right? And this is going to be important because as you saw at, uh, at the bottom of the passage we just stopped with, that there was this little note by John, this day was a Sabbath day. So he was looking for someone who wouldn't, wouldn't recognize him. He was looking for someone who had something to pick up, something that they owned to carry with him. And by the way, he chose a Sabbath day in particular, and this is going to come into play. Because he could have um, chosen Monday or Tuesday or any other day of the week, which would have been just fine. But he chose a day in which the Jewish religious people said it is uh, unallowable for you to do any work. And the religious leaders had made a, a, um, a big construct, a big teaching, and made it very specific. You can only walk a certain amount of steps, but not one more, right? You can only um, go to certain places, but not very far. And you couldn't work, which would include picking something up and carrying it with you. And so Jesus was making a bigger point here. And when he talked to this man, he had a interesting but perhaps a little slightly offensive question, right? He says, hey, do you want to get well? Right? If you're that guy, you'd be like, uh, yeah, right? It struck me, why did he ask that question? I could imagine ever going to the hospital and seeing people and ask them, hey, do you want to get well? Nah, I love being in the hospital, <laughs> right? <laughs> but that's an intriguing question. Why is that intriguing? Because not everyone actually wants to get well. Well, why is that? Often, if you have some type of affirmity and you have it for a long time, that affirmity becomes your identity. And you do not want to lose your affirmity because then you'll lose your identity and you'll lose your community and you wouldn't know what to do. Now, I see this, and this can be best seen in perhaps I read an article about uh, people who were deaf, right, couldn't hear. And there's new technologies that allow some people who are deaf to hear. And I was intrigued by the response of some of the people in the deaf community. They said they didn't want to have their hearing restored. 
Because if they had their hearing restored, they no longer could be a part of the deaf community, and they didn't want that. So they said, no, thank you, I don't need that. It's also interesting to me, being a pastor for about 30 years or so, that I talk to people, and some people love to be a victim, or be depressed, or have some type of issue, because if they have some type of issue, they become, that's part of their identity, and they get their identity, this is how they get their attention, so they actually don't want to get better. Now, I have to ask us, do we want to get better, be whole? Or you say, well, this just is how I am. I'm angry. My dad was angry. My grandfather is angry. My kids are angry. We're all angry. You want to stop being angry? No! Right? You guys understand what I'm saying here? Jesus wants to work alongside our will, right? And so we asked him, do you want to be well? Right? Now this guy um, answered his question saying, that's why I'm here. And there was a rumor, there was a belief around that time that when the water in this pool was stirred up, some manuscripts will say that they believed an angel at some point would stir up the water. And the belief was that the first person into the water was a person who would be healed. This is what they understood. So they gathered around this place in hopes of the water being stirred, in hopes of that they would be the first one healed in, so in hopes of that they would be healed. This is why this man responds this way. He says, sir... He didn't know who Jesus was. He says, sir, I'm here because I want to get better. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm close to the water. But I'm unable to move well. And so when I see the water is stirred, I go as quickly as I can to get there. But I don't get there fast enough because someone always gets into the water first. So he was desperate, and he desired a change in his life. So Jesus told him a few things. Number one, he says, get up. Right? Get up. Now, he just didn't leave it at that. He didn't say, get up. Right? Now, if he would have said that, the man would have indeed been able to get up and just get up. And maybe he would have rejoiced a little bit, and maybe he's like, I'm going to hang out here for a while with all my friends, right? He says, get up, pick up your bed, pick up your mat, roll up your sleeping bag, right? Get up, roll it all up, right? And brother, walk. These were very specific instructions. Why? Jesus was working, and he told this man, pick up your mat, bro. And walk around, because I have a couple people that I want to observe what indeed you're doing here. The works of God are intentional, they're strategic, and they're bigger than they originally seem. Miracles and the works of God always have a greater purpose than the work itself. Healing is not an end as in a goal. Healing is a means to an end, a way to an end. Sometimes people just want something so that they have that something, be it more money or healing or some type of help 
And once they get that, they think I've got what I've needed. Right? That's not the point in God's kingdom. He can and does these things so that something greater can happen. Right? If you say, well, I just want to be healed, I just want to be healed, just want to be healed. Why? Well, so I can be healed. And then what? So I can collect seashells. Or sea sights. Is that what you want? Or, God, will you empower me? Will you enable me? Will you help me to do what really matters most? If you get physical healing, right? I'm not against it. I'm for it, actually. Very for, for it. Guess what? You're still going to die. You're still going to die. All of these things are temporary. What matters most is what is eternal. So God, help us to see the temporary through the eyes of eternity. Right? What are you doing here? If your ultimate goal is to honor Jesus... You can honor him if you're healed, and you can honor him if you are not healed. What is your goal? Miracles and healings are, are a means to an end, not an end in itself. So here's Jesus strategically working in this place, the house of mercy near the temple, on this day, which was the Sabbath, to this man who was lame with a bed with specific instructions, pick up your mat and walk. And then anonymously, he then slips back into the crowd to prove a bigger point. And the first is to reveal our hearts okay so number one jesus strategically works and he continues to strategically work today he hears your prayer he understands your situation but he works strategically for a bigger plan first part of that plan is to reveal our hearts let's continue to read what happened here verse 10 of john 5 so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, the man said to me, He told me to pick up my bed and to walk. Verse 12, they asked him, Well, who is it? Who is this man who said to you, Take up your bed? And walk. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn. And there was a crowd in the place. Now when you read that, does that kind of tick you off a little bit? I hope it does. Right? Here was a mighty miracle. Here was a guy who hadn't took one step for 38 years, right? Wasn't like he just tripped and broke his leg yesterday, right? 38 years continuing to need to be carried, continuing to need help, continuing not to do the work he wants, continuing not to have the life he necessarily wanted. 38 years. And all of a sudden, Dude laying down in desperate circumstances is dude walking around, and the first thing they say is, you can't carry that bed. Right. Are you kidding me? Why didn't they say, it's a miracle. This is amazing. I cannot believe this happened. I'm so excited for you. That would have been the right response, right? 
They didn't respond that way. They didn't even ask, what did he do? He says, why are you walking around carrying your bed, yo? Their religion blinded them to seeing the work of God. But it's not like us, right? That never happens to us. But then we have to stop and ask ourselves the same question. Wait a second. These overly pompous, religious, pious individuals could only focus in on what they thought was wrong and they completely missed what God was doing. Right? Does that ever happen to us? We have to ask ourselves the question, well, Wait a second, I wouldn't be that way. I'm not asking you that question. I'm asking you, are you that way? <laughs> are you more concerned about how the preacher dresses than what the preacher says? I'm going to step on some toes, y'all. Get ready. <laughs> well, he doesn't wear a suit. He really isn't the man of God. Right? Well, if he wears a suit, pff, he's really not a man of God. Who cares? Am I more concerned about the seating than I am about the person in the seat? Am I more concerned about their flaws than I am about their faith? Am I more concerned about their tattoos than I am about if they're teachable? Am I more concerned about their skin color than their sin condition? Am I more concerned about what they are drinking or what they are thinking? Now, none of you all have any of those religious hang-ups, do you? I'm glad you're laughing. Think about that. Jesus anonymously did a specific miracle in a place where he could have done a lot of good. He specifically ministered to this man. And then he slipped back into the crowd because he wanted to see how people respond. He wanted to expose their hearts. And Jesus will expose our hearts as well. He'll do things in certain ways or not do things to see if you really want him or you just want what you can get from him. Do you hear me? I hear you clapping out there in the cafe, by the way. I hear you. <laughs> that was kind of the point from last week. Are you seeing what the Holy Spirit is doing through these, stereo, these things? <laughs> Pointing to this guy, pointing to this woman, pointing to that guy, pointing to this guy, and pointing to us, right? He tests our heart, Job. You remember the, the book of Job, right? I'm just throwing this in because I guess we all need to hear about it. Job, will you praise me in this storm? Job, I know you praise me when all things are good. Will you praise me when all things are not good? Same question is to us. When is it easier to be connected and praise God? When all things are good or when all things are not good? We know it's here, right? Both. Thank you for answering that way. Jesus is doing the same thing here to reveal these hearts of the religious conservatives, the religious elites, those who take their religion seriously. Probably like most of us in this room. And these men responded according to their heart. What are you doing? They missed the works of God because of their religious rules. 
we have to ask ourselves this question. <laughs> when we encounter Christianity, when we encounter Christ, when we pray and we ask God to help us, God hears you. He's not like, well, I'm too busy to listen to you today. It's not how it works. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. The eyes of the Lord see everything. When you pray according to His will, and when you pray, God hears you. Do you trust in what he is doing, O oh man, O oh woman? Or do you think you're greater than God and you get angry at him when he doesn't do things as you think he should? God doesn't need your counsel to what to do. He's looking for your heart. His ultimate goal is to conform us into the image of His Son. That we have the heart of Christ that will follow our Father every place, every time, everywhere. These things cut to our heart. We can point to these Pharisees, but i got to look at me first. What am I most concerned about? Jesus was making that point about what he did. He went away. And then let's see then what happens next. Jesus, by the way, is not content to fix what we think is our greatest need. He looks to address what actually is our greatest need. Thirdly, Jesus identifies our greatest need. So we have the scenario. We understand what's going on. The religious elites are kind of up in arms. This guy says, hey, don't blame me. This guy, whoever he is, told me to do this, right? Jesus is just setting up the scene. He knows exactly what's happening. And then this takes place. John 5, starting with verse 14. Now, after this interaction, after this man could move, after he was carrying his sleeping bag, right? This man went to the temple. Afterwards, verse 14, Jesus found him in the temple, and he said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more. That nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. Jesus knew this man. He knew where he was going. He knew he was going to go to the temple. Why? Well, in the Jewish culture, that if you are healed of anything, that the law says that you are to go to the temple and you are go to see the priest to be verified that if you're healed or not. Hello, Quivio. Good to see you, buddy. Great. And I have a sermon to preach, so I'll finish it and we'll do that later. I've learned sometimes when everyone's looking at what's happening, I'll just stop and I'll say hello. And then we can get back to the regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> I'm glad you're here, Q. I'm glad you're here. So Jesus went to the temple because he knew this guy was going to be there because this guy had to go and be verified that he was indeed healed. By the way, if you ever, um, if God ever heals you or you believe he's healed you, go get it verified, right? I'm glad someone said amen to that, right? Even, even if your dog gets a broken leg, you think God heals his leg, go get it verified, if it's your cat, maybe not so much. <laughs> oh, what just happened right there? <laughs> Joking. Love your cats, too. 
So Jesus, he didn't have to go to the temple, by the way. He didn't have to show himself to this guy, by the way. Right? He could have just snuck out and got away with not confronting the Pharisees. Right? And you're going to see this as we read through John. He's going to start putting the pressure on the Pharisees. He could have done all that. He could have just slipped away and said, well, what's it got? didn't have to do with that today. Nuh-uh. He was making a bigger point, right? Found the guy, says, hey, you're well, aren't you? They said you were well, right? See, you're well. And then he didn't say, have a nice life, right? You notice what he did next? <laughs> Sin no more. What? Then nothing worse may happen to you. Now what is he talking about? He's not talking about something worse physically. It doesn't get much worse than not being able to walk for almost 40 years, right? It's not like, well, make sure you don't sin because if you sin, you're going to probably get a heart attack, right? He wasn't saying that. Not at all. What is he indicating here? Saying, listen, you were healed, that's a great thing, but the healing is a means to an end that you could see who I am and you put faith in me for what your real need is, is for forgiveness of your sin. Right? Because what if he was healed, never put his faith in Christ, and ended up in hell away from Jesus for eternity? That would be much worse. Right? That's what healings and miracles are all about. It isn't necessarily about your physical body. It's about your eternal soul. You understand that. A means to an end, not an end of itself. Jesus says, this is awesome, this is great, but hey, let me tell you something. Unless you believe in me, unless you get your sins forgiven, what's going to happen to you is far worse than 38 years of being paralyzed. Right? This is what Jesus gets to. Dealing with the sickness of our soul and all of us. Our spiritual cripples. Sick beyond repair and there's only one cure and it's found in the blood of Christ. Jesus builds this case revealing who he is and he said to him, hey, hey man, you got to deal with the sickness of the soul. Right? If you don't, something's worse going to happen. I want you to be truly whole. He delivers this message. He identifies our greatest need, which is beyond anything physical. Identifies it. Now, in so doing, this man now who was mobile knew who this person was, Jesus, that was very intentional for Jesus to connect with him. And so this man then, he went away. Went to the Jewish officials, say, hey guys, I want to let you know, don't be mad at me. I find out who healed me. <laughs> His name is Jesus. And now we see the bigger issue. And we're going to see more of this next week. Okay? But I have to connect to this point. This is what... John the Apostle, this is what the Holy Spirit, this is what Jesus himself was doing, identifying who he was. This is the last point. Jesus is equal to the Father. Not just a gentle healer, not just a moral teacher, but God in the flesh. That's the bigger point. Of seeing Christ for who he is. The name that is above all names. Verse 16 of John chapter 5. And this was why. John's commentary to us. This is why the Jews were persecuting and prosecuting Jesus. This Greek word is the same here. 
because he, Jesus, was doing these things on the Sabbath. There it is. How God dared to work when I think he shouldn't. Who does God think he is? Who do you think you are? Verse 17, and it gets interesting here. But Jesus answered them as they were persecuting and prosecuting him. And again, we're going to look at that next week. This is Jesus' defense. And it is curious and it is powerful. Jesus says, well, my father is working until now. And I am also working. Verse 18, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father. Making himself, there it is, equal with God. So why did they draw this conclusion from what Jesus said? So they were accusing Jesus of working on the Sabbath, right? According to the Ten Commandments, it says that you are to rest on the Sabbath. And Jesus then was working, and he caused another person to work. So they're saying, you are a Sabbath breaker, so therefore you, know, you cannot be God because you're breaking the Sabbath. Now Jesus' defense is super interesting. He says, my father is working until now. Okay, So... The understanding at that time by the rabbis, right, the religious teachers, the pastors, was that God continually worked even on the Sabbath. Because if God stopped working, the whole planet would explode, right? He holds everything together, right? We could no longer breathe. There are no longer birds being fed. There would be no longer gravity or anything. So they agreed, the religious community agreed, that God works on the Sabbath. So there is a um, God exemption for working on the Sabbath. Okay? Are you following me here? So when Jesus said, my father is working until now, they're like, yeah, yep, yeah, he is. And then he says, and I am working. And in their minds... They made a connection. He's saying he is equal with God. Jesus was saying the exemption that God the Father gets, I get to because I and the Father are one. I am the Son of God. We are equal in value, different in role. I and the Father is, is, are one. And they understood when Jesus said, well, the exemption that the Father gets, I get. They said, oh, so you're calling yourself equal with God? Exactly right is what he was saying. So not only did they want to kill him because they were messing up their little religious system, Some of us do the same. Try to run Jesus out because he isn't fitting within our religious box. Not to say that theology isn't important. I'm not saying that. Theology is very important, but right theology is important. So they just didn't want to kill him. Because he broke the Sabbath, but they really wanted to kill him all the more. Because he was making himself equal with God. That was the bigger point. And that is the point of God working even today. It's not about the miracle, it's about the Savior. It's not about just our physical and external life. It's about our internal hearts. These things are for those things that are eternal. That all points to the identity of who Jesus is. These things are written 
so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. Does that sound familiar? Right? That's the goal of this entire book. That's the goal of the Gospels, that you would, I would understand who Jesus is. And we understand who we are in comparison to him, what he's done, who he is, and that we would believe in him and have life, abundant, eternal, forever life in his name. This is what Jesus was driving at in all of these encounters, be it Nicodemus, be it the woman of the well, be it an uh, a official with a son who is dying, be it this man who could not barely move. He was bringing them all to understand the greatness and the glory of God seen in the face of Christ. Do you understand this? I'm going to come in for a landing now. Dave, what does this have to do with me, right? My hope is and my prayer is, here's the deal. I know you're not going to remember this sermon, right? I just want you to remember one thing. You get to discern what that one thing is. Maybe you'll remember that I have to be careful that my religion does not get in the way of my relationship with Christ. Maybe you need to understand that the ultimate goal is the glory of God, regardless if he answers the prayer you think he should in the way that you think he should, in the timing he thinks he should. The ultimate goal is glorifying of him and our hearts. Maybe you need to move from welcoming Christ, from what he can give you, to honoring Christ for who he is. Maybe you need to move from being a church attender to being a real Christian who follows Christ. There's a difference, all of you church attenders, because you're here. Maybe today you say, I knew, I see who he is. I've been looking for surface issues. I've never been looking at my heart. God, forgive me of my sin. I give my life to you. So you and the Holy Spirit decide what you need to hear today. Right? We sang songs about Jesus' name, and we're going to sing another song. Right? We're going to pray, and I'm going to pray for you. And by the way, if you have any prayer needs, there are always people by the sign that says prayer, right? If you need something specifically prayed for, which most of us do, actually. <laughs> That's there as well. So, Father, here we are gathered together in this place to honor you. So grateful, God, that you are moving in our midst. You are answering prayer that way because we are asking that you'd be glorified for the sake of your name. You bring us to faith and follow you in obedience. And you ask us to do this among all the nations, including this one. God, I ask that our passion for you would increase. And God, forgive us. Because of our religion, we miss you. <laughs> Help us to embrace you and understand what you're doing, regardless if, if you answer our prayers the way you think we think you should. Help us to just see who you are. Understand that you are good. You work strategically. You are for our good always. And you measure good through the scales of eternity. Not through the temporal scales of our immediate issue. Expand our hearts to see you more. Expand our understanding to know you greater. And God, I ask that even today that, that someone would pass from death to life. Do that today. God, do that in our families. Do that with our kids or grandkids or a spouse or a neighbor. Help us to see who you truly are. God in the flesh. 
the eternal king who laid down his life, was risen again, who will come in his glory and who will make all things new. Encourage our faith, God, to help us persevere. Give us strength, God, to see you in the midst of difficulty. Exalt yourself in this place because we trust you, God. Do your work in us and through us by your spirit we ask for your glory and your honor. Because you are the great one. And we praise you this day. In Jesus' name, amen.